Thank you for joining me today on Side by Side. It really is great to know that you're joining me each day uh, at some point in the day and it's lovely to be able to share these thoughts with you. Now, as these passages are deep, intense and heavy in many ways, it's not possible for us to expound the whole detail of any one of them. But let me leave you with a thought to allow you to go into the passage for yourself. Chapter 2 today, and the subject, which is a heavy and a weighty subject of judgment. Before I do that, I'll tell you a little story. I recall whenever I was uh, 10 years old, I was sent to live after my mum died with a very generous family. I There was a son who was the same age as I was, and so we shared a bedroom and we shared a bed. Now, there were times whenever our behaviour got a little bit over the top, as you can imagine, boys being boys, as the phrase is. And downstairs below us directly was his father's study. So when he might be doing some preparation work as a minister and the light began to swing back and forwards, I can imagine he realised it was time to intervene, which he did, coming up the stairs and we would dive into the bed. Everything was normal. He would come in and he would address his own son. He would punish him, but he never punished me. Now there was judgment. And how did I feel about that judgment? Well, one part of me felt, oh, relief, but the other part of me felt very bad because I should have been getting the same judgment as well. And who knows, I might have been the one who started the whole thing off, which would have been even worse, and I'm sure it was the case from time to time. When we come to this passage, chapter 2, those sort of emotions are in the background. Paul begins by saying, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you judge, you the judge practice the same things. Now, I think he has in mind the sort of ancient method where you, it's called a diatribe or a diatribe, where you uh, put words in your imaginary critic And so you put phrases as you would think of them having a conversation with you. And I think he has a Jewish critic in his mind who's looking upon the Gentiles with a degree of those terrible Gentiles. I mean, mean, imagine who would ever get up to all of that behaviour. That's the behaviour that Paul referred to in chapter 1, where God gives people over to this various types of sin life, which really is a tragedy because the giving over is judgment in itself. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but... Certainly when I've met people who have been involved in various sinful practices at times, they feel these things have so enslaved them now that they are in misery. And so it's not great joy after all. And so when the Jew might look at that person, it, it's a, bit, a little bit like the two, the two men who went up to pray that Jesus referred to in Luke 18. And he said, you know, a man went up to pray and he looked across at this, this tax collector, this other man, and he said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like this man, (laughs) you know, and that's the spirit of judgment. So against the background of us judging one another, which we do, and we do it all the time, because every time you and I criticize another person, we're making a judgment of them, be it right or wrong, but it does remind us of the moat and the beam that Jesus spoke about, that when you see the moat in your brother's eye, don't forget the great plank in your own. It reminds us, that we're all guilty. And that is what Paul's trying to help people to understand, that you have no excuse. When you judge another, you judge yourself. And he goes on then to speak about various types of judgment, how this judgment will work out. And I just want to quote from William Henry Griffith here, because he talks about the principles of judgment that are expressed in this little passage, because God operates by principles. In my preparing for this, I was drawn in a spirit of grief for our sin and joy for our Saviour. And that is the backdrop against which we understand his judgment. 
Paul talks about this here. He talks about God's kindness. Do you not know that God's kindness, his forbearance and his patience are meant to lead you to repentance? And that's what he says in verse 4. So that's the backdrop of all his judgment. So when people say to you and I, oh, God is that cruel, angry God in the sky, that's not right. God, when he judges, judges on principle, and he has shown us great, great mercy. And so W.H. Griffith Thomas, Thomas, Griffith Thomas has these four or five, uh, four principles that he finds here in this. And I'll just list them to you, and then you can think about them. Verse 2, he says, God's judgment will be according to the truth, and therefore it will be absolutely impartial. And he quotes, We know that the judgment of God is according to truth against all that practice these things. So there's no variation. It's not like you and I, when we judge, we, we don't have that capacity to make a perfect judgment, do we? I mean, if I say, well, what, were, they, were, they, were they bad? Well, yes. Were, were they wrong? Well, yes. Well, but did you know the motive? Did you understand maybe the things that fed into it? Can you feed all of that? Do you know the whole story? Quite often we don't. And we may make an incorrect judgment. But God's judgment will be absolutely impartial. And there will be no treating one different than the other in terms of principle. And, and that's really important for us to remember that. And then the second principle is based in verse 6. Where God's judgment will always be based on absolute justice. He will render to every man according to his works. Truly just It'll have that perfection about it. Not only will he treat everybody the same, but he will treat everybody absolutely justly. And you'll walk away and you'll say, that was right. He was right. In fact, God's judgment upon us is so gracious that if he were to give us right now what we deserve, it would be too much to bear. And so it's good to know that in this, there's no middle, no middle pathway you, there only are two classes of people in the world, those who pursue one way or the other way, who pursue honour and immortality or who pursue a life apart from God. The third principle is that there is no respect of persons with God. That's in verse 11, that it is uh, for God shows no partiality. It may seem a little bit like the first principle, but he tends to see that there's a slight difference in this. And the, those with the, the law will be judged according to the law, that's the Jew. And those, the Gentiles who don't have the law, will have the law of their conscience. So that everybody has a certain law pressing in to which they know and recognize and is true. And then the fourth principle of judgment is that both Jew and Gentile will be brought face to face with Christ and the gospel in the ultimate judgment. And there he quotes, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according the secrets of men according to my gospel by Jesus Christ. Sorry for my delay there. But as I was thinking about this, the whole weight of this uh, sense of judgment is something that we tend to ignore, I think, today. We see it in the world around us. We demand judgment. We demand justice. I mean, you couldn't live in Ireland today and not hear the cries for justice, the mother and baby homes, the children sent to boarding home, homes, the endless calls for justice and judgment all the time, every day. And of course, why should God not demand justice and judgment in his world as our perfect father? Of course, we know that what he has done is he has judged his son. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has taken the judgment of God. The wrath of God was upon him so that those who will put their trust in him will be forgiven. This is the great good news, the good news against the bad news. And it's the good news that we celebrate today. And it's a great way to begin this week, isn't it? Remembering that, yes, God is a just and fair God. He has judged his son in our place. Of course, that means that you and I, if we have trusting in him, it's, it's really responsible for us then to live in a way that would please him. We now can do that, and that's also important. And if we don't do that, 
well, I think God's justice will say that that's wrong and that that shows that we do not have the true life of Christ at all. So let's rejoice in this truth and let's uh, continue to pray into this and read into this today as the Lord will lead you and guide you.